running after me. <laughs> How about now? Yes. Okay. So, when we go um, E-shopping, we're always trusting that there is some secure mechanism so that we are paying the right people for the right amount. Uh, whenever you send out an authenticated email, or whenever you connect to your bank to check your bank account. We rely on cryptography for all these activities and we trust it's working correctly. Um, the application of cryptography are actually widening, for instance, electronic passwords nowadays are using cryptography to provide the information, um, your personal information to a system. Um, and there are consumer electronic devices that are starting to deploy cryptography to protect the software or um, the applications that can run on it. And there is actually a money value on cryptography. There are companies whose job is to provide um, authentications and security through cryptography. And so we can have an idea of how much is the market for cryptography. Uh, RSA, which has been bought by EMC a couple of years ago, um, has been bought for 2.1 billion. Uh, VeriSign was doing, the up until a couple of years ago, was doing all the authentication for all the Visa and MasterCard transactions in the world. They sold that branch to uh, Symantec, and now they focus on uh, secure applications that don't require authentication. And then there is a whole industry that wouldn't exist if we didn't have cryptography out there. Uh, eBay and Amazon's companies worth tens of billions of dollars only exist because you can guarantee secure transaction between consumers and the company. So it's very important that this type of uh, transactions and this type of authentication is actually working correctly. Uh, my old talk is going to show how we can actually break the system without using a software exploit, by exploiting faults in the hardware. And we're going to see how. But before I go into that detail, I'm going to give you a four slide tutorial on RSA authentication. Uh, there is actually a security tutorial this afternoon, and I encourage everybody to go to that at 1.30 if you want to know the long version of this. I'm just going to give you whatever we need for uh, our application. So let's say Alice, which I know this doesn't work, so Alice is the curly girl up in the corner, wants to talk to Bob, the guy with a baseball cap. And she's not concerned that everybody's going to listen to her. But the concern here is, um, how does Bob know that it was really Alice talking to him? Let's say the message is, hey, Bob, meet, meet me at our secret location. And maybe Bob goes out with a lot of girls. Who knows you know, if it's really the Alice secret location or somebody else's secret location? So it needs a way to know that that was really Alice sending the message. How can we solve this? There are three or four mechanisms uh, that provide authentication communication. A very popular one is RSA. In, or actually, in general, there are three or four within asymmetric cryptography. So what Alice does is she creates two keys, a yellow key and a green key. The whole trick about the keys is that when one key locks, the other unlock. And if the other key locks, then the first key can unlock. So what she does is she creates a yellow and a, and a green key. She sends out the yellow key to everybody. All she wants is when she talks to people, they know it's really her speaking. So she sends the yellow key to everybody, and then she sends her message to Bob. But before sending it, she locks the message, she encrypts it with the green key. So in order to see the message, you need to have the yellow key. Alice yellow key. So she encrypts the message, she sends it over to Bob, and Bob uses the yellow key to encrypt it, to unencrypt it. Now, if Bob gets something that is not garbage, that means he, the message was correctly encrypted by Alice. And so he knows that, that was really Alice talking to him, not somebody else, like the nasty guy down here who's Charlie, the guy who always tries to spoof other people's messages. OK. So um, RSA cryptography will always work with two keys. Um, keys are big numbers, by the way. We call them keys just to make it more things you can relate to more easily. Um, how do you generate the two numbers? First of all, you need to come up with two big prime numbers. When I say big, I'm thinking 1,000 bits, really big. It takes time to generate the keys. 
Then you compute the product of those two big numbers, n. And then you need to find two numbers, d and e. And there is a constructive way of doing that. I'm just not going to cover it. You have to find two numbers, d and e, such that the product of the two numbers is 1 in the word that is modulo n. And that's really the good thing of it, because if I have those two numbers, then I can send a message. Uh, I encrypt it by doing the power to the power d and modulo n. And then somebody else takes it and then does to the power e. And then we come back with the message again. So as long as there is a D and an E, we come back to my original message. And that's why I need the green key and the yellow key. And when I put them together, then I get my message again. It doesn't matter if you force to do the E or the D. OK, so then the private key, the green key, is two numbers, D, one of the two uh, numbers I came up with, and N, so I know what modulo we are working with. And the public key is E and N. OK, so let's remember, everybody has a yellow key. What is really, really important is that nobody gets to copy my green key. If I have the green key, then I can act as Alice. So if I have the green key of Citibank, I can create a website, make it look like Citibank. You're going to connect to me. You're going to believe I'm Citibank. And you send me your legal password. And then I do whatever I want. Okay. So this is about authentication. OK, so when the world works the way it should work, um, Bob sends an email to, to Alice. Alice encrypts it, sends it back to Bob. Bob decrypts it and says, oh, yeah, that's really my message. So I really talk to Alice right now. Great. Let's keep talking. When things go wrong, people have been trying to um, get the green key. How do they do that? Well, several techniques. One way is try. Just keep trying all the possible 1,000 bit numbers until one is going to get you the clear message. Um, it takes a long time. So some people, uh, three years ago, have been able to brute force a 768-bit RSA green key just by trying all the possible number of decrypting, you know, in decrypting a message. So they tried to basically extract D. And they were able to do that. It took hundreds of machines and a lot of time. So basically several computation years. The same researcher said, well, I think, given the computing power we have out there in the world, it would take at least five years to be able for somebody to break 1,025-bit RSA. And the RSA community is thinking, mm, maybe so we should start reaching to 2,000. You know, let's keep ahead of the hackers. But they haven't done that yet. Still, the mainstream RSA size is 1,024 bits. And then there are other techniques. One is a side channel attack, where you measure how long it takes to do the encryption. And based on that, you can start guessing the key. Now, an attack like that was actually perpetrated a few years ago. And after that, uh, the algorithmic community has been developing exponentiation algorithms that have fixed amount of time, fixed amount of computation time. So you cannot measure timing anymore. And that doesn't work anymore. And then another technique is to try to create faults on the processor. Make the processor do mistakes so it does incorrect encryption. And if the way it does incorrect encryption is a certain type of way, then I can get some information on my green key. That's exactly the technique we're going to try to uh, exploit. So that's what I'm going to try to do today. OK, so attacks with trans and fault. What is a fault? A fault in the hardware community where I come from is when a transistor doesn't do its job correctly. So it's supposed to switch and it doesn't switch, or it switch when it's not supposed to switch. It outputs the, correct, the incorrect value at the correct time. Um, there are two types of faults. Permanent faults, when a transistor is just broken and it will never work again. And transient faults, where there is a glitch on the transistor. It doesn't work for a portion of a second, and then it keeps working just fine again. Uh, transient faults actually exist. They're there all the time. Um, they're part of your processors. They're not an hypothetical situation. Uh, a definition is it's a short perturbation of a logic value in the chip for a very short period of time. Now, most of the time, nothing happens. But if the wrong value gets latched into a flip-flop inside that chip, then you start having incorrect values propagating through the system. Those incorrect values can, impro can propagate to the software stack, and then you can start having wrong data and wrong computation. If a Transient Harold hits a processor when he's adding your balance in your bank, you're going to all of a sudden have an incorrect balance. Extremely low probability. Most banks don't care about this. Sometimes you're lucky. OK. 
What can cause transient falls? Cosmic rays, alpha particles, for instance, if you live in Denver, much higher risk of transient falls. Because there are, it's a, a Denver, Colorado is a city with a very high altitude. Uh, it's a one mile high. And because of that, it's exposed to many more alpha particles that can hit processors and uh, affect the behavior of transistors. They're not really controllable. Um, you don't know when and what is going to hit for how long. Um, another thing that is important to know is 10 years ago, transient faults were really an issue because transistors were big, fat devices, and they would, the energy of the alpha particle would not be enough to switch them. Transistors today, inside there, in the, between the, the source and the drain, have maybe 50 atoms. And this, it doesn't take much energy to switch the value of the transistor. We expect in 10 years to have maybe five atoms in there. And then when an alpha particle hits, it will probably affect many transistors at the same time. So it's a problem that is becoming more and more relevant as silicon technology scales down. So the question today is, is it possible to perpetrate a security attack with transient fault? We know transient fault exists. The problem is, can we harness them to do exactly what we want and uh, activate themselves right when we're doing encryption, right on the right place on the encryption, so that we get the information we want? So, um, faulty RSA authentication. So how can we get information if something goes wrong in, the, in an RSA authentication? As I showed you before, when everything goes correctly, the client here has a message, he owns a yellow key, sends it over to the server who has a private key, the green key. The server turns around, encrypts that message, and sends it back to the client. And then the client, using the yellow key, can decrypt it and say, yeah, that's exactly what I have sent over, so I'm talking to the right server here. Okay, well, everybody's happy. When something goes wrong, what may happen is that the, the client sends a message, the server is encrypting, and right when it's encrypting, if transient fault strikes, so it doesn't compute the correct encrypted message, it computes the corrected version of that, and it sends that over to the client. The client tries to decrypt it, it doesn't know what he got, and depending on how the message is being faulted in the computation, I may be able to extract a little bit of the information on the green key. A little bit of the private key. So this is our setup. Um, I have it here. So there is um, that board. I know it doesn't really look like a server, but that's a server. Okay? It's this board up here. I don't know if you can see that note. So this is an, um, an FPGA board which has been mapped so that it emulates a Spark V8 processor. It's actually a complete Leon free system, so it has a Spark V8 processor, it has an Ethernet uh, connection, um, and can basically run an application you want. We were able to run this board at 40 megahertz. It's called Sparky, and it's running Debian Linux. So basically what I have is a board which is a Vertex 2 Pro. On top of that, I'm mapping a Leon free processor, and then I'm loading the Leon free processor with Debian Linux, which is also including the OpenSSL library, which is a typical library to create, to do encryption and decryption and running SSL. Basically, any type of mainstream uh, authentication and security algorithm. Okay. Then I have a voltage controller. So my way of in injecting fault, instead of waiting for an alpha particle that you never know when it's going to arrive and where it's going to hit, I'm going to use this voltage controller to lower the voltage to my processor and it just so happened, that's true in most processors, the multiplier is a really complex piece of equipment inside the processor. And when you lower the voltage, that's the first guy to give up. So the multiplier starts doing errors if I lower the voltage enough. As you can see now, I don't know if you can see that, but the nominal voltage of operation of this thing is 1.5. If I lower the voltage to 1.0 volts, everything will go wrong. It just, it wouldn't be able to do anything at all. But if I go to 1.25, it will do a mistake every now and then, okay? Not always. Okay, and then, you know, so I have, a, a, I have a network switch back here so that my client and my server, which doesn't look like a server, can talk to each other. Now, you may wonder, how did I bring all these to LS LCA? Uh, well, I brought the demo and I brought a baby. And so then I could package the demo with the diapers, <laughs> which are, <laughs> thank you, which are basically the best type of padding you can use for electronics. Yeah, 
Okay, so why there are errors? Well, so this is like basic logic design 101. When you do a logic circuit, there are always flip-flop, also called registers, then it's a bunch of combinational logic that does whatever computation you need, and then the results of that are latched in the next set of registers. If you keep your voltage, where the company tells you to keep your voltage, all the signals at the beginning of the clock cycle come back on the register, do all the computation they need to do, at the end of the clock cycle, they are latched on the next register. But if I do the nasty of lowering that voltage as I suggested, then signals are propagating more slowly. And so some signals may fall behind and what I'm latching is the wrong value. That's basically the same effect of the transient fault. Only that it's under my control. So that's how we basically apply this uh, attack. Okay, so let's look at the algorithm inside OpenSSL that, that computes RSA authentication. This is the basic algorithm. OpenSSL, well, it doesn't, so, okay, the basic OpenSSL does this. It uses a fast technique to compute uh, the encrypted message called Chinese Reminder Theorem. And that's a very fast algorithm, which you kind of need if you're running things in software, otherwise it will take too long. Then it checks if that result is correct by decrypting it. And if it gets an error, say, oh, something went wrong with the Chinese Reminder Theorem, let me use fixed window exponentiation. Something that takes longer, but it's guaranteed to, everything, to do everything correctly. Uh, okay, so this is the fixed window exponentiation algorithm. What we have to do is the formula up there, right? We take the message, we do power to the D, and then we do modulo N. And D and N are my private key. D is this monster number, 1024 bit. How do I do that? I first divide the number D into windows. Windows are just chunks of fixed lengths of bits. I'm showing here four bits in OpenSSL is six bits long. And then for each window, I first, sorry, I first, um, I keep basically a running result called S, and then I compute M to the D for that window, and then I shift the result by four bit by basically doing S times S four times, and then I do the second chunk. I have a, actually a running example here. So let's assume my key is super easy now, just eight bits. I take the result S at the beginning is one. Okay, now I compute wind, window one, the first uh, shifting doesn't need to do anything, still one. Then I compute the message to 1101. I do the second iteration. I shift the number by four bits to the left by doing that iterative squaring. And then I do the second iteration by using the second bit, 0110, uh, 0110 and I have my m to the d modulo n. Okay, that would be great. Now, what if something goes wrong? I only need one way of things going wrong, which is this. I'm doing the same operation again. I get, sorry, M to the 1101. Then I'm doing my shifting and an arrow strikes on my multiplier, right when I'm doing my squaring. And I want the error to only affect one multiplication and one bit in the multiplication. If it affects more than one multiplication, if it happens again before I'm done with encryption, if it affects more than one bit, that's trash to me. I'm not gonna get anything good out of that. But if I get those right type of error that affect only one bit in one multiplication, in one iteration, and basically they, in math term, they become a plus and minus two to the F, where F is a position, which bit of the 1024, that's good stuff. I can use that. Okay, uh, and then I'm gonna cut, by doing that, I'm gonna get an incorrect signature. So how do I extract the private key? Well, I, the client is the guy perpetrating the attack. It generates a whole bunch of messages and sends them over to the server. The server encrypts them and sends them back. The client check, are they correct? Yes, no worth anything to me. Are they incorrect? Maybe they have the right type of incorrect problem. So let's keep them. It keeps all the incorrect messages and then we try them all one at a time. The way you can solve this problem is by trying to solve window by window the D key, and you need to start from the most significant window. And there is a theorem and, and, and the proof of why is that the case. And I don't want to go into that detail, but we could offline if you want. So you basically try all the messages until it can get the first window. And then it tries all the messages again until they get the second windows. And it keeps going until eventually it gets all the windows of the system. Okay, so now, what does he have to do for every window? Well, 
this is basically my formula with the correct message in it. I assume I know the most important window already, and then it took my second window. I need to figure out what's the value of that, possibly in real open cell at most six bits. I need to figure out which bit is being affected, one of 1,024 bits. And I need to figure out which of the multiplications, like there are six squaring steps, which of them get affected. And I know it looks daunting, but it's really not so much work. I had to try two to the six possible number for the kid, a thousand possible number for the position, and six possible number for the multiplication. And I just go for it, and I brute force it until I find one that works. And if nothing works, then I need to start doing two windows at a time. Which is okay occasionally, but if you need to start doing five windows or more than that, then, then you're back on trying to brute force RSA. I mean, the benefit of all this is I can brute force four bits instead of 1,024 bits. So, for each window, I have to first guess what's the possible value of my private key for that window. And then I have to try a 1,024 error position, whether the bit flip was from zero to one or one to zero, and which of the squaring iteration got affected. And in, with other system, each of these checks took about 100 seconds, then 100 seconds times two to the six times 64 to try all the possible value for that window. And then for all the messages we have until one worked. Okay, so how do we inject the faults? Um, well, I can show you, actually I can show you some results now. So that was my setup. I'm gonna see if I can show you what is running in here, hopefully. Okay, so this is the analysis phase here that is working. I have a number of broken messages. It will try all the messages I have and compute which are useful. As you can see on that pie chart on the right, the green messages are the good ones, with one bit flipping, one multiplication, only one error in entire encryption. The blue ones are the ones that have too many errors, so I, I cannot do anything useful with them. And the, green, the red one is the one that have uh, multiple bits that have been flipped because the voltage was too low. Again, garbage to me. Then, on the bottom graph here, for every good message, we can see, oh, it was helping us figuring out which windows, and this is telling me how many signatures I have analyzed so far, and what, how many of the windows I discovered so far. As you, this is a very simple demo, 128 bits RSA. I can start seeing the key showing up as more messages are analyzed. And I think I don't even have enough messages because three windows are not analyzed. Now, you may say, hey, lady, you said I have to do the most important window first. This guy is doing any windows around them. Um, through that, I have to do the most, in window, in the, uh, most important window first. I, in the demo, I wanted to basically show you for each message which window is helping me reveal. So I already did the analysis. I'm just trying to give you some feedback. Oh, this message up on this window, this message up on that window. Otherwise, we would have to do all the messages first window, all the messages second windows, and you will probably leave the room before I'm done. So I was trying to help it in that sense. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation. By the way, I can uh, have this set up in some press room, for instance, if you wanna try other stuff too. Okay, so by lowering the voltage, I generate the incorrect messages, and then I have this offline algorithm that try to find out what happened. So my technique to, infold, to inject fault was lowering the voltage. Um, how did we do that? So I said 150 is a nominal voltage. Now, as I lower the voltage, the number of faulty products increases. However, I don't wanna just go all the way down because there is a sweet spot. If I go too down, I start having too many faults in the initial multiplication. I want to have only one error. And so you see that sweet spot around 126 is when I have a small number of errors overall, but the high fraction of those are good messages for me. And this is what we did. So we use a 1024 bit private key and standard OpenSSL, unmodified OpenSSL, so the windows was six bit. Um, we collected 8,800 8, corrupted signatures and took 10 hours to do that. These are many, many more signals that you will need, but I couldn't control upfront which were the good ones and which were trash. 
And then it took 81 machines running in parallel for 100 hours to process all these messages and get all the windows out of the information. Okay. We continued that. We said, you know, how often do you get to control the voltage of the server in your bank? I don't get to do that. How am I going to get the private key of that server? So, first of all, there are systems that you can control, like your Blu-ray player, which uses RSA authentication. You have control on the voltage of that thing. By the way, this voltage controller, $600. Completely affordable. <laughs> I mean, it's affordable if you're a committed hacker. Uh, so the, you know, if you have a PlayStation, you have control of the source power of that system. Uh, but, again, I have the problem of the server in my bank. What do I do with that one? So we thought, can we inject faults with temperature? We just heat up the system. And by the way, in case you're not a hardware person, when you overheat a processor, it's a doing mistake because the signal propagation becomes lower. It's the same thing as lowering voltage. Just add the two control, you know? Here I have a voltage controller, I can say 1.23. With the, with the heat lamp, I kind of say, please, I want 55.5 degrees Celsius. I get what I get. <laughs> you know, so we tried to hit the system with a lamp. Um, what we were able to do so far, this is ongoing work. First of all, we tried only on 128 bits RSA. We weren't able so far to get to 1024. And we did temperature with a little bit of voltage control too. Just because of the setup we had, I mean, we had very basic system. We want to try with laser. I think we can do much more precise attacks with that. What we found is we could actually get... <laughs> We could get um, all the uh, bits of the private key when working around the 60C. There is one problem in temperature. You cannot just overheat, because then it just burns down. Okay? You need to overheat just a bit, and, and it's hard to control how much, and it's hard to control the area. It's much more difficult. Uh, this is kind of how temperature goes with the probability of error. Do you see how steep that curve is? And I, I really want to be you know, on this turn right here. But if I get it a couple of degrees wrong, I'm way out. That's why it's difficult to do temperature. I, I have a very steep curve, and I need to hit it on a very narrow place. But we're working on that. OK, so conclusion. Um, transient faults are a problem. I know most of you are software people, and they're concerned with software. And software is a problem, too. Uh, but if you get software perfect, I can still hit you with the hardware issues. Uh, we were able to attack you know, stock OpenSSL or 0.98i, which was the one available at the time. Uh, there was the one available until two weeks ago, actually. Um, and we attacked the fixed window exponentiation algorithm. So after the error happens, it tries again to do the computation as a safe measure. Uh, we attack a complete server, which is a Leon, a Leon 3 Spark system. And before publishing this work, we actually send a fix to OpenSSL. Um, OpenSSL kind of ignored it for a year, and they recently, uh, the fourth was two weeks ago, they released version 1.0.0f, which actually can overcome this issue. Instead of checking for the error, it always does, the heavy duty system. And if the fixed window exponentiation has an error, it checks that before sending the message, it decrypts it. If it finds an error, it just goes into an error routine, and it doesn't send any message out at all. So that the thing didn't work, but at least we don't leak information. This was published uh, at a conference called Date in Europe, and the paper is available online. There are also a number of little press releases, but they don't explain the technicality of the work. Now, little advice for IT people, software people, people that don't want to really deal with transistors and their issues. Uh, keep your library always, always up to date as much as possible. And don't do nasty stuff to the hardware, because it can lead it to leaking information. So overclocking, no cooling the rooms where you keep your systems, your, your server farm. Uh, try to have stable power sources. Um, now, a hardware can go wrong and can fail in many different ways. But if your system crashes, at least you know it crashed. Silent data corruption, the type of thing that happened with, with this type of attack, are much worse, because you don't even know that you're leaking the information. So they kind of blindside you. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.
certainly packed in a lot of information there. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions. Um, and if you are so like um, of the ilk that you want to ask a question, could you come down towards the front? Because um, there is a large room here. Is there any hands up? Yeah. Ah, oh, yes, good. Hi. Um, have you considered using any uh, high energy particles, particle accelerators, to cause bit errors? I'm sorry, I did not understand. Um, considered using high energy particles from particle accelerators, high energy neutrons, those sorts of things, to directly create SERs. Okay. So, what, what's the question? Well, so high energy particles will also cause bit flips and oh, yes. um, transient errors. Have you considered using those and directed beams of those from using particle? password in preparing the attack? Yeah. Well, instead of using heat or reducing the power supply voltage, you can also cause bit flips by. Firing. Uh, we haven't considered that. Okay. I mean, so let me give you a little bit of background here. I'm not a security person. Uh, we didn't come to this with the idea. Oh, we're all about breaking RSA. I actually do the reliability. I worry about making microprocessor work even when transistors go bad. And the expectation is 10 years from now, one transistor will break in a modern processor every day on average. And of course, you don't want to replace your processor every day. So there is a lot of research going on in how do we make a processor work when like 90% of the transistor work, not all of them. And so we did a bunch of work on you know, the impact of this fault and how damaging they can be. And there is a portion of my community to say, silent attack corruptions are not really a problem. I mean, they're so rare. And if you don't notice it, probably nothing's going wrong. And I didn't feel that was actually very correct statement. So I said, mm, let's try to find an area where something like that can do a lot of damage. And that's why we came up with script so I said, okay. So that's the corner of the whole story. Any further questions? Uh -oh. Ooh, look at them all. Hang on. <laughs> have you thought about applying this where you, you have web servers that use perfect forward secrecy modes where they dynamically are generating? So you can generate a lot of actual heat on the CPU by making a bunch of client connections and then sort of ramping up and checking That's awesome. Errors so you're suggesting to hit the server on purpose by sending a lot of client connection and making it work really hard. Yeah, yes. like dynamically generating primes? We bit. thought about possibly co connecting remotely to, this, to the OS and often there are operating systems that can control the fan, so they can control the cooling, or they can pace the processor, lower the frequency, make that thing go wrong, so that it doesn't try to cool the system, and then we have our temperature nice falls. Yeah. Uh, you're using a soft core in this case. Is it easier or harder to reproduce this in real silicon? So without, without the FPGA? So right now we did this on FPGA just because it's easier. Um, we actually did try for a while to do a real silicon. We actually were trying to image which portion of the chip were overheated so that we could start controlling that. Um, it's something that, I mean, I don't think it would make much of a difference, but it's something that definitely we would like to try going forward. It requires having a more complex setup. Modern processor, you know, this is a very simple pipeline. Right? This is like an in-order pipeline, nothing out of order, no multiple pipeline, and there is a one multiplier. It's like, as big as a potato, it's easy to hit that guy, you know? <laughs> Never mind, you just answered my question. Um. <laughs> but by the way, I mean, I, it's a very simple processor, but it's not something I made up uh, in a class. I mean, it's used in, uh, in avionics, I think, this processor is used quite a bit. It's only used, though, for type of microcontrolling application. Pretty sure, like, uh, if you are on a plane, the coffee machine is regulated by a Leon 3. Uh, you know, simple activities, but yet it's used quite a bit. I, um, I read about someone doing something similar for this. They were doing smart cards and the, they used microwaves. Yes, they did do it on a smart card in the past. So this is the first attack on a complete system uh, that is a complete processor, yes. So the smart card only runs a very simple microcontroller and this is a complete microprocessor.
any further questions? Oh, one more. You used Open SSL. Yes. But would this work against a, another implementation of the same algorithm, like RSA done by someone else? Does it need the source code for your attack? So, the attack can be applied of a number, on a number of classic algorithms to do exponentiation. As you can see, I'm only using the basic idea that there is one bit flip in a multiplication. Um, so, the, whether using OpenSSL or another library matters, it all depends on the implementation of the libraries. If the library is designed so that it checks the encrypted message by decrypting it, and in case I need an error, it doesn't send the message back, then I cannot do anything. I need to collect incorrect messages. OpenSSL was actually doing that, and then I, that's why I could apply the uh, perpetrate attack. So depend on that aspect of the library. If the library is protected against sending out incorrect messages, this attack cannot be perpetrated. Um, have you considered using your FPGA to emulate the faults instead of futzing with the hardware? Emulate the what? The faults. To make the FPGA emulation fault to the hardware. <laughs> nice that you asked that. Actually, we have a whole setup, which is where we were coming from, where we can, I mean, we map on the FPGA both the processor and an infrastructure that can activate at runtime any faults I want in any transistor location. And then we were running our tests for our fault analysis business by putting the operating system and then flipping, activating some of the faults, see the impact. We are trying to see basically what fraction of faults are damaging, what fraction are tragedies, and what fraction nobody will ever notice. For instance, uh, we were playing Doom, which you can play Doom at 40 megahertz if you have some patience. <laughs> <laughs> and then we would activate the faults, and about half of the faults wouldn't matter because, you know, something changed in the room where you're playing, but you wouldn't even notice. And half of them uh, do a system fault, the system crash. And then you do notice because you have nothing in your hands anymore. So we did have that setup. We can do that. The reason we didn't do that is because I think you believe me more if I'm not touching the processor instead of like, oh, I hack this thing, I put the faults where I want, whenever I want, and here is RSA, right? So I was trying to keep it clean. Okay, thank you very much. That was a great presentation, and we have a small conference for, uh, gift from uh, Lynx so Conference much. Australia. It's a, a gold-plated pen uh, glass penguin. And um, thank you for making us feel a little bit uh, less secure. <laughs> <laughs>